Hey everybody, what's going on? Uh, just wanted to do a. Well, you know, I really didn't put a time limit on this talk because I was just looking at at some notes and I was just thinking to myself, man, these notes are boring. I mean, I, the brain is a fascinating structure, but usually when you get in a class and you look at the notes for these things, that they're, they're really boring. So I kind of wanted to go through some of the notes that I actually provide for my online class and kind of talk about some of the different things in the notes. Maybe, you know, put more of a practical spin on some of the structures of the brain. I'm just going to keep on rattling until I run out of gas. Just walked in from a long day at work and I really just want to take some time to kind of discuss this because it's actually been on my mind all day. You know, we got these notes, we got these PowerPoints, we got some great images, but what the heck does it all mean? So I'm going to stop gabbing on that, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip to the screen share. And I want to be able to show you exactly what I'm looking at, because I want to pull up some of the notes that I use in my class um, every semester. So this is talking about the brain here. And, uh, you know, really, I just want to walk through some of the structures of the brain, and uh, we'll see how long we go, and uh, we'll just keep going until we keep going. And, you know, it, it, that's the cool thing about Google+. Plus. You can shut me off and, and, and watch me at a latter date. You can download me to your smartphones or whatever, and you can listen to this thing if you like it. And if you don't like it, hey, you can shut it all off. So let's start with the cerebrum. Now, now the cerebrum, you got to remember, the cerebrum is the biggest part of your brain. That's, that's the part that we typically see in pictures and everything and the cerebrum has what's known as cerebral hemispheres which is basically you've got a left cerebral hemisphere and a right cerebral hemisphere and um, although they physically look alike they do totally different things now what's interesting is the fact that the left hemisphere uh, in innervates and receives information from the right side of the body and the right hemisphere receives information and you know sends information to the to the right side of the body so it, it's kind of weird you know uh, you see one side controlling the opposite side of the body and one side of your brain controlling the other opposite side of the body and 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 you notice that line down there it says over, overlapping and indistinct boundaries some aspects not easily assigned to any single region in other words it's not like the United States you know if you look at the map of the United States you can see the boundary lines that are clearly marked on the map that shows you where Georgia ends and where Florida begins uh, you can see where Tennessee begins and where Kentucky begins. You, you can see those places. You can see where those states are lined up beside one another and you can tell where one state ends and one state begins, but you can't do that with the surface of the cerebrum. It, it, we just know general areas, but it's not very distinct. Now, um, one of the things you have to remember about the cerebrum is that it has different areas of the brain. Uh, different areas of each cerebral hemisphere has specific areas that affect higher order functions. So when we talk about higher order functions, we're meaning things that transcend above, you know, just being able to walk. Things that transcend just being able to tell your small intestines to continue to move food substances down the track. We're, we're talking about deeper things like memory, cognitive thought, acknowledgement of certain smells, acknowledgement of certain tastes and sights. That's what we mean. So when we get down to the basics of the, of the cerebrum, we find out that there is something that is a little more definitive, and that's the five lobes of the brain. Uh, and the lobes of the brain are basically named for... Um, for the cranial bones that cover them, um, except for the insula, you know, because the insula is actually deep. You can't really see the insula from the outside of the brain. But the other four are named for the bones that are covering over them. So, of course, the frontal lobe is the one with the frontal bone over it. The temporal lobe is the one with the temporal bones on top of it. The parietal lobe is the one that has the parietal bones over it. And then the occipital lobe is the one that has the occipital bone over it. The insula is the fifth one and he's the one that's deep. You can see him in this image here. There's the insula. Uh, notice that in order to see the insula they had to show you an MRI from an entirely 
different perspective. This one is showing a sagittal view, whereas this one is not. This one, uh, we're kind of seeing this actually from a posterior view. Um, no, not posterior, uh, but we can st we can still see this um, pretty regularly. Uh, actually, no, I think this is posterior. We've just gone far enough ahead so that we can see the frontal lobe from the back. But this is the insula that's deep within the cerebrum, and then here's the temporal lobes, which you can see easily here. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a posterior view, and if you're like, how did he figure out that was a posterior view? Because this whole uh, that's that's the that's at the base of your skull. That's um that's that occipital that that's that um magnum foramen, which is a really big hole in your occipital bone where the spinal cord actually passes through. Kind of cool, huh? So you've got five different lobes. You've got frontal, temporal, parietal, occipital, and insula. Now, if we keep talking about lobes, we got to talk about what their functions are, like the frontal lobe. That's the guy who, um, if you've ever w watched the movie One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and different things like that, they talk about frontal lobotomies. I think it was the, I think the last country to do legal frontal lobotomies as a punishment. You know how we do lethal injections for prisoners and the electric chair for prisoners. Well, I think the UK was the last one to actually do frontal lobotomies for serial killers and serial rapists. I think that they didn't stop doing that until like the 1950s. For this, so this was this was the kind of thing they did for your Jack the Ripper's type people. Uh, they actually removed a portion of the frontal lobe and you can see why because the frontal lobe deals with like voluntary motor function so those are things that you choose to do physically uh, concentration and verbal communication so have you ever noticed that when people are trying to concentrate they kind of tap their forehead isn't that interesting um, you're trying to concentrate and you're sitting there putting your hand on your forehead talking about think 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 um, verbal communication, decision making, planning, and personality. That's why they did a frontal lobotomy because, you know, that area is for decision making and it helps deal with consequences. You know, when a four year old is thinking about, hmm, should I snatch this cookie off this plate in front of Aunt Myrtle? Well, he starts to contemplate. As the older that child gets, the more developed that area of the brain becomes, allowing that child to be able to think more and more about consequences. That's why anyone out there who's ever owned a cat, you already know that cats are smarter than dogs, which this makes cat owners really excited, but only to a certain extent. Having been a person who owned cats and owned dogs, uh, cats have been said to have cognitive thought on the level of a five-year-old. And that's one of the reasons for that is because a cat has a, uh, an area of the brain, which is this, that's uh, developed enough for them to be able to think of consequences. Okay, if I do this, I can get away with this and get around this situation. Uh, the parietal lobe, uh, the parietal lobe, one of the most popular things about the parietal lobe that people learn about is that the postcentral gyrus um, is, is actually located on your parietal lobe. Uh, remember that a gyrus, remember there's there's a gyrus and a sulcus. A sulcus is a valley and a gyrus is a hill. So you know you've got two hills and a valley. There's the postcentral gyrus and the precentral gyrus and in between the two gyri is a sulcus which is the central sulcus and uh, physicians use the central sulcus as a landmark because pretty much every one of us have a central sulcus and if you can find the central sulcus then you can find those two gyri and one of the key things about that area of the parietal lobe is the fact that it deals with general sensory functions so we're talking about general sensory functions not not things like sight sound and smell and things like that but general sensory functions like you know things like pressure and and um, temperature and, and things like that it also helps you to evaluate shapes and textures of objects. So um, this this kind of the kind of helps when you pick up something and you say this feels soft versus this feels rough or this feels coarse or this feels smooth. That area of your brain allows you to be able to do that. The temporal lobe. One of the most popular things about the temporal lobe is that it helps you with hearing 
and smell. So the temporal lobe gets involved in specific senses or special senses because hearing is way more detailed um, than touch. Touch, um, really half the time you don't know what you're touching without help from A, your um, ability to see what you're touching and B, your memory. Literally. I mean, if, if we if we blindfolded you, stuck something in your ears so you couldn't hear, stuck something in your nose so you couldn't smell, stuck something over your mouth so you couldn't taste, covered your eyes so you couldn't see anything, and had you stick your hand in a bag, the first thing that your brain would do is it would go through its memory banks in an attempt to try to think of what does this feel like automatically. So, you know, um, your 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 range of touch you think it's more advanced than what it really is but really your brain is relying on you know touches uh you know your brain is relying on getting that incoming stimuli from touch and then uh adding that on to the information in your brain that comes from your special senses like hearing and smell occipital lobe uh, is in the very back of the brain uh, it's responsible for processing visual information and storing visual memories, which makes sense because if you get hit in the back of your noggin, uh, you have trouble processing incoming visual information and everything looks fuzzy. It also stores visual memories, which can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. Uh, some people might, you know, when you that's why when you see certain things, it can um, it, it it's it's really good to be able to see what you're talking about or what you're learning. For example, the bodies exhibit, and you know, I'm not I'm not receiving one plum nickel from the bodies exhibit for saying this, but students who typically go to the bodies exhibit before or during the time that they're taking an anatomy and physiology class do extremely well. Now I know if you're watching and listening to this and you're like, well man, you should have said that in the very first video you ever made. Well, you know, it costs money to go to the bodies, bodies exhibit. And so I try not to, you know, stick people for their papers like that. But if you do get a chance to go to the bodies exhibit while you're taking anatomy and physiology courses, I'd highly suggest that you do go um, because being able to see these things will bring back memories when you're taking your test. And of course the insula, the insula deals with memory and interpretation of taste. Man, let me tell you something. It, <laughs> um, have you ever been eating something? I had this lady, uh, I was trying to explain to a friend of mine, we went out to eat, we went to a Cajun restaurant and there was a lady who was the uh, waitress, and, and my friend said, I've never had alligator before. And he asked her, what does it taste like? And she said, oh, it tastes like chicken. And I just kind of gave this look like, mm, nah, 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 I wouldn't say alligator tastes like chicken. You know? uh, but she was trying to compare it to the only thing that she could. Your brain oftentimes will make things taste like chicken the first time that you eat it. But if you wait a while and continue to eat different things and then come back to that item and taste it again, it won't taste like chicken. Instead, it'll taste just like what it is. Um, and you'll find that when you eat uh, wild game or you eat meat that has a gamey taste to it, oftentimes we will associate that food, that flavor with something that's extremely common and that's not even related to that animal just because your brain is just trying to find something relational with that. Let's skip a, a, a bit ahead. Let's talk about some different areas of the brain, uh, specifically the cerebrum because I, I want to get into this as well. Sometimes people have trouble understanding what areas do. Let me say this first and foremost. Remember, your brain makes up like 97% of all the neural tissue in your entire body. So basically, the brain is one massive planet made out of nerve cells, and they're all interconnected. So they're usually receiving, you know, so each, each little space or designated region of the brain is processing information so that it well it's either doing one or two things it's either taking information that just came into the brain and processing it so you can figure out what it is or it's taking information that's already in the brain processing it so they can send some information out 
that's usually one of the two things that a neuron in the brain is doing. So when you look down here and you look at the functional areas of the cerebrum, there's specific structural areas with distinct motor and sensory functions, you know. And there's three categories. There's a motor, a sensory, and an association area. Now, at this point in time, if you haven't figured out what motor and sensory mean, let me tell you, motor is always referring to an action. It's always referring to um, it's always referring to um, an, an action, an activity. It's referring to, and I'm thinking, trying to think of the word that I want. Um, what is it? An effector. That's what I'm trying to think about. I'm going, my, trying to take my brain all the way back to chapter one. Um, when it talks about receptors, control centers, and effectors. You know, motor, anything motor is dealing with the connection between the control center and an effector. Motor, motor areas, motor commands, it's all about doing something. It's an action. Whereas sensory anything is talking about being receptive. It's talking about the receptors responding to stimuli and then bringing that information into your central nervous system. So motor, anytime you hear motor, that's that's that signals about to go out to stimulate an effector to do something, whereas uh, sensory is talking about incoming sensory information that's being processed um, so that you can know what you saw. And then association areas do just that. They associate things. They put things together. So when you look at these motor areas, you'll notice that there's a primary motor cortex that's on the pre-central gyrus. Does sound familiar? Huh? Huh? Remember, we talked about the pre-central gyrus of the lobe. Um, and it controls voluntary skeletal muscle activity. And skeletal muscle, for the most part, is usually voluntary muscle. Usually the skeletal muscle, most of the skeletal muscle moving on your body is because you told it to. Um, whereas when you talk about other motor areas, there's the motor speech area, uh, also known as the Broca area, that, that's um, allowing you to be able to control your muscle movement so that you can talk. But not just talk, but talk a certain way. It controls the muscles you use to control uh, your accent, your dialect, the whole thing. So, you know, you ever meet people who have a wide range of, um, of voice you know, voices, you know, like voice acting, like someone can talk like Mickey Mouse. Come on, Pluto! <laughs> you know, like that, or you're talking to Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, Gee, Rocky, look what I'm about to pull out of my hat. I don't know, Bullwinkle. You know, things like that. So the motor speech area helps you to do vocalization and control the muscles that go into actually being able to talk. Um, the frontal eye field is another area. Uh, it regulates eye movements needed for reading and binocular vision. So, you know, it helps send signals to the muscles that are attached to your eyes so that you can actually move your eyes. Um, my problem is that my eyes follow movement. So I can be sitting there talking to somebody, and if somebody gets up over their shoulder, my eyes immediately go to that person, you know, and the person is looking at who's talking to me, and they're like, Hey, are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to you, but I'm sorry, but things around me, things in motion always catch my eye and causes my eye to, to pay more close attention to who's moving around me. Sensory areas, things like primary somatosensory cortex. Now, think about this. Somatosensory is talking about um, sensory input from outside of the body. You know, things that 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 work your or stimulate your exterior receptors. So things like proprioceptors, which deal with, um, they are special receptors that are in your muscles and in your joints. They kind of tell your body where your other, where your body parts are. So you have proprioceptors that are in your elbows and your wrists and your knees, and they tell your body where your limbs are. Uh, you have touch receptors, which they don't tell you anything. They they kind of tell you what something feels like, but they don't necessarily tell you what that thing actually is. Pressure um, receptors, uh, they can tell you the difference between um, someone's thumb um, pushing down into your hand too hard versus a light touch from like a mosquito landing on your arm. Um, pain receptors, uh, we'll get, we might get a chance to talk about those later on. 
uh, not not in this video, but in another, and temperature receptors that kind of you know tell you uh, what something feels hot or whether something feels cold. Now you need to understand something. These sensory receptors very important to you, very important to your life, but they're not specific. Okay, like for example, temperature receptors. Some people cannot get over the fact that temperature receptors are not specific. And they'll sit there and argue with you. They'll tell you, oh no, temperature receptors are specific. Oh yeah, they're special senses. They gotta be because they can tell you the difference between hot and cold. Yeah, but they can't tell you the exact temperature. I mean, it's not like you touch some water in your bathtub and say, hmm, that feels about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. No, your hand is not gonna tell you that. You're gonna stick your hand in some water, you're gonna pull it back and you're gonna say, eh, it's kinda warm. And that's about it. You're not going to be able to tell the, the exact temperature. So it can't be exact. So these are referred to as general, um, they're general senses. And these guys actually um, are, are, you know, gathered at the primary somatosensory cortex. The sensory uh, homunculus, uh, that's an interesting structure. It, it has large regions that, it has large regions um, in the sensory homunculus to pick up sense incoming sensory information from areas like the lips, the fingers, and the genital regions. So the sensory homunculus uh, tends to be one of those structures or one of those areas of the brain that's uh, actually talked about in uh, sexuality classes and things like that just because of the areas of the body that um, send sensory information from those areas of the body to this particular area to be um, processed. Uh, some other sensory areas, primary visual cortex processes incoming um, visual information, primary auditory cortex receives and processes auditory information which is basically the stuff that you hear, primary olfactory cortex processes uh, um, provides conscious awareness of smells. I love that part in this note because it provides conscious awareness because sometimes you don't have, most of the time, not sometimes, most of the time you don't have conscious awareness of what's in the air. I mean, seriously, about less, you know, less than 10% of what's in the air around you right now. Okay, uh, take, let's, let's do this. If you were to inhale air through your nose, less than 10% of what you inhale actually comes into contact with olfactory receptors in your nose. Over 90% of the air that you inhale through your nose, you never actually smell. Yeah. Yeah. Go look it up. Seriously. See, you don't even smell it. That's the lie behind Febreze. I mean, if you spray Febreze in the air, now, for, now all you folk out there who work for Febreze or something like that, don't come hunt me down because I'm not trying to feel that. I'm just, I'm just spitting the truth on how Febreze works. How Febreze really works is you spray some Febreze in the air, the chemicals in the Febreze bind to the receptor sites inside your nose, therefore blocking any of the chemical receptor, any of the chemical molecules, uh, the scent molecules that are in the air from being able to bind to your olfactory receptors. And so because no, no, no smell molecules in the air, uh, n none of those chemicals can bind to your olfactory receptors because the chemicals in the Febreze have bound to them, then technically you're not stimulating anything and you can't smell anything. Go figure on that. Primary gustatory co cortex located in the insula guess what? Involved in processing taste information. Uh, so when you eat something and you're trying to figure out what it is that you taste, that you're tasting, that's where all the information goes. Now, association areas. This is pretty interesting. Association areas, uh, what they do is they integrate new sensory inputs with memories. Uh, they'll process and interpret data or coordinate um, a motor response. So there's like really two key things that association areas do. They'll they'll take in, they'll take data that you just got. They'll take incoming stuff that just got in. They'll process it. They'll interpret it, and then they'll coordinate what you need to do in response to it. 
whereas the premotor cortex, what it will do is, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, not the premotor cortex, but the second thing that association area will do, other than processing the information and then letting you know what you've actually got and then coordinating an offensive, is association areas will take new sensory inputs and they'll connect them with memories. Now, this is extremely powerful because that's why certain smells make you think of certain things and certain things that you hear make you think of certain things. Like, for example, um, a long time ago, um, I had this really bad breakup. Um, broke up with this person and it, was, it, 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 it started off as a smooth breakup and it wound up being really ugly, okay? And there was a particular R&B CD that I was listening to during that entire time when I thought this thing was wonderful and, and full of sugar and spice and everything nice. And then when we broke up and it got really ugly, I associated her with that CD. And so every time I heard music from that CD, I would think about her. And I was not thinking nice things. I was thinking ugly things. And so you could, people, my friends noticed that my attitude would actually begin to there would be a slight change in my attitude when I would when that when any song from that CD would play because I had associated that sound with that emotion um, and with that memory. So uh, the, the memories are very powerful. You see them in people from time to time. Now um, the the note here gives some examples of some association areas where they process and interpret data and then they turn around and coordinate motor responses for you. For example, the premotor cortex, um, it, it coordinates skilled motor activities like playing the piano, playing the cello, um, um, <laughs> believe this or not, video games like uh, you know when you're like when you're playing a, a very complex video game especially if you like playing it on an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller you know the the buttons and everything uh, can be kind of challenging for people I've got really big hands so joysticks like those don't really bother me but for people who have smaller hands they gotta do a lot of coordination to get that going on for them. Uh, somatosensory association areas these are really, really interesting. I really like this area because it's kind of cool because what it does is it takes incoming sensory information and it allows you to figure out major details about things just by touching that thing or just by um, just by yeah just by having some type of touch relationship with the structure. So you can determine the texture, the temperature, the pressure, the shape of objects. You can basically blindfold a person and they can pick up stuff and they can they can get it in their hand and they can feel it and they can actually tell you all about that structure without actually having to see it because you can articulate that shape in your mind just by touching that item. Absolutely fascinating. Um, visual association area, really cool thing, helps process visual information and allows us to figure out the things that we're seeing. And now, what it does that really helps us a lot, and you see this in babies, is it helps to integrate visual information into recognizable faces. This is amazing when you see this area start to develop in a baby because you'll see the baby and you know the dad comes home and it's like, hey, hey, and the baby's looking at him like, who are you? You know, uh, it's, it's funny, and the dad gets his feelings hurt because he's like, darn, you know, the baby don't recognize me. Well, you know, that, that, associate, that visual association area is having to kick in, is having to develop, and, the, the, you know, the, the more that baby sees you, the more that baby remembers you. As a matter of fact, in the early months of, of, a, of a baby, they can't really see you and remember your face as well as they can remember your sound and your smell. Because remember, um, if that baby's been in the mom's womb all those months, and if you've been talking to that baby, that baby will recognize uh, the sound. Notice that a baby does not pull away from its mama after it's born. Um, that baby recognizes that mom's smell, and it recognizes that mom's uh, touch, and it recognizes the, uh, the, the mom's um, sound and smell and touch. Um, if the father spends a lot of time doing some kangaroo care 
um, with the baby, then then the father can ultimately see some some similar um, re results from that uh, from the baby as well. Auditory association area uh, interprets characteristics of sound and stores memories of sounds heard in the past. Which you know um, people are amazed when I'm riding along in the car. They are absolutely amazed when I'm sitting there talking and a, a song comes on the radio and the song plays like the first five seconds and and I'm like oh snap I can't believe they're playing that and they're like what 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 I said that and they're like what and I'm like that you know listen a little longer and then it takes them another 20 or 30 seconds to really catch what the song is and they look at me and they're like how'd you figure out what song that was within the first three to five seconds well you know I I've listened to a lot of music in my day and so uh, you know the auditory association area it, it it stores memories of those sounds you know it interprets the sound it stores memories of the sound and then it pulls it right up man if I had been as good with um, my studies as I was with music I probably would have been straight A's uh, some other association areas I think there's like three more um, these are really cool like functional brain regions uh, they integrate information from individual association areas. So, so an example of that would be a Wernick area. In other words, the Wernick area doesn't just associate, you know, doesn't just deal with one group of stimuli. What it does is it takes multiple association areas, integrates the information together, and then creates something amazing. For example. Um, an association area takes all the eggs and puts them together and interprets them and says, look, we got five eggs. Uh, another association area will take all the milk, put it in a cup and say, look, we got about, uh, you know, a cup and a half of milk. And then, you know, another area will say, oh, look, we got flour. Check this out. It's like about three cups of flour. But a Wernick area, a functional brain region, will, will what it will do is it will take, it will integrate all of those ingredients and create something brand spanking new. So for example, the Wernick area, which is very important, it deals with recognizing, understanding, and comprehending spoken and written language. So, so what winds up happening is when someone is talking to me, my Wernick area will recognize what they're saying, it will comprehend what the person is saying to me, and it will help me to understand the words that are coming out of that person's mouth. If a person's Wernick area is damaged, they really have problems trying to understand what people are saying, and worse yet, they oftentimes have difficulty speaking. Uh, and so they can't carry complete sentences or complete conversations with a person. Whereas the Gnostic area, you've probably heard of the Gnostic area, uh, it deals with regions of the parietal, occipital, and temporal lobes, and it takes a whole bunch of information from association areas, and it provides comprehensive understanding of current activity. So it allows you to be aware of what's going on, which also works with your cognitive thought, so that you have a complete understanding of the activity around you. This is very, very important for people who work in high stress situations who really need to be able to understand the big picture of certain moments. These are some images that just kind of show pictures of what's going on. We've kind of talked about this already. Um, if you've never seen these images before, you can pause this video and take a look at these images and see what's going on there, but we've actually talked about what's going on here. I laugh every time I see this picture because you got the guy right there all over to the far right talking about some, here man, I got two hot dogs, have one. And he's like, yeah, thanks man. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, um, there's the dude over the side of his shoulder that's scarfing down that hot dog uh, and you're wondering, why is he eating his hot dog privately so no one else will see? But what you don't know is the guy scarfing down that one hot dog is actually the date of the redhead, and he wanted to eat that hot dog and not get her one. But I'm just, you know, I ain't want to gossip, so you ain't hear it from me. Now, moving right along, we get to the cerebrum, uh, talking about the case of Phineas Gage. Dude, if you've never seen anything done on Phineas Gage, Go to uh, the historychannel.com or something like that and look up the case of Phineas Gage. Uh, that's one interesting dude. 
basically back in 1848, Phineas Gage uh, was working with a railroad company where they, um, they blast rocks and they lay down railroad tracks and they put down spikes. And the way that they used to blast rocks would seem absolutely positively insane to any of us nowadays. But it was the method that they used back in the day. And what they would do is they would drive a spike into the rock and they would cause an explosion and cause that spike to go down to the rock and split the rock open. Um, well, sometimes, every once in a while, they would have a freak accident and the uh, spike would go backwards and it could fire back and it could kill a man. So Phineas Gage, who was kind of like a mix between Gomer Powell and Forrest Gump, as they described him in their journals, uh, a really nice, uh, quiet guy. He was holding the rod. The explosion happened. The rod went through Phineas Gage's head uh, below his left eye. Now, now you need to... Um, you need to understand something about how this rod shot through Phineas Gage's head. They still have his skull on display in a museum. You you got to see a picture of his skull. When that thing went through his head, I mean, no, really, seriously, a large iron shaft went through his head. It went up through, um, you know, underneath your 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 bottom jaw, underneath your mandible. Uh, those, those, uh, I think it's the myeloid muscles or whatever underneath the, the, the tongue muscles there. Uh, that thing went up through the jaw and protruded and shot right out through the frontal um, bone of his skull. Yeah, it went straight through um, and, and made a hole in his frontal lobe. Um, and... Um, so it, you know, part of it shattered part of that frontal lobe and everything, and so anyway, long story short, before the accident, dude was always showed up to work early, quiet, cool. Um, after the accident, the dude turned into you know dirty boy rock. I mean, you know, he he was easy to get angry. Dude was uh, he did all kinds of things. I mean, when you read the story about him, first he was Gomer Pyle slash Forrest Gump. Uh, after the accident occurred, uh, he would he would curse out his manager, throw his tools down, walk off the lot, head straight to uh, head straight back to his room, start packing his things. After he packed his things, by the time he packed his suitcase and started marching back downstairs after he quit his job, he would suddenly forget why he quit his job. Head right back upstairs, unpack his bag put everything away, get dressed and go back to work, curse everybody out, do it all again tomorrow. Uh, after he did die, I don't remember exactly how long it was before he died. I think he lived like a whole another 30 or 40 days before he actually died. And uh, it, it was an amazing situation. Okay, uh, I think the only other thing that I really wanted to show you was an image here of um, lateralization so you can kind of see what the hemispheres actually do. You look at the specialization of the hemispheres, you can see the left hemisphere has the motor and speech area over there, some areas for right hand motor control, uh, an area for language and mathematical comprehension, which is Wernick's area. This is like, you know, your engineering, that's part of your engineering brain right there. There's a right visual field, but on the right side of the brain, this deals with memory for shapes, uh, some language comprehension, left-hand motor control. Uh, there's, this is the area for musical ability. Uh, this is the area for recognition of faces and spatial relationships. So when we say someone is right-brained, we, we oftentimes that, that person who's right-brained is very artistic. Not autistic, but artistic. Um, they have a flair for poetry. Um, they're really good in, in painting, uh, the visual arts. Um, they're really good in uh, visual concepts, whereas the person over here who's left brain, usually the left brain person is a lot more logical. Um, they're, they're, they're mathematical. They work really well with equations and things like that. Uh, some people are more of the other than the other, and then some people learn how to balance between the two, which that's your best bet. You want to be able to balance between the two. 
Um, one last thing that I wanted to talk about, and then I think we'll wrap this video up because I think this is long enough, and we'll come back and do another video on some things tomorrow. Um, you, one thing is you've probably heard of a disorder called epilepsy, and epilepsy is a neurological disorder. Basically, what's happening in epilepsy is the neurons are firing a bunch of action potentials way too quickly. And a lot of times we can control epilepsy using different medications. Sometimes we find that we can remove a part of the brain and that'll stop epilepsy. Sometimes they use a laser to actually burn out a certain group of neurons to actually stop the epilepsy. And in a severe case, they do what's known as a hemispherectomy, which is when they, uh, they take a whole side of the brain out to stop that and we're seeing more and more children who have severe epileptic seizures they'll take out a whole section of the brain and that kid will actually be just fine because at that early of an age their brain begins to learn how to compensate for those areas that it doesn't have so the brain says oh well I don't have this area then what I'll do is I'll I'll lean on my other areas my other association areas to help obtain enough sensory information so that I can bring enough areas to process and interpret enough information so that I can still make complete cognitive thoughts. Think of epilepsy like um, think of epilepsy like when a TV uh, is unable to focus in on a channel. Have you ever have you ever been messing with a radio dial and you're getting in two or three radio stations at the exact same time and it's just a complete chaos? That's what happens with epilepsy. That's so you're getting all like two or three of these different stations at the same time. You can't focus in on one, and the brain just can't handle that. So that's all we're going to talk about for now. Um, I do believe that uh, a lot of the other things dealing with the brain are are a lot easier to understand than the cerebrum at times. Um, you've got the diencephalon, and really three things in the diencephalon that are pretty important are the um, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the pineal gland. The pineal gland because it makes circadian rhythms um, that balances your day and night cycles. If your circadian rhythms are jacked up, you're probably going to be taking some kind of medication just to get your sleep cycles correct. You can just talk to somebody who lives up in northern Alaska for a long period of time and then moves down to Florida. That's really going to mess you up. Um, the pineal gland also secretes melatonin, which is very important for like balance of your sleep and wake cycles and things like that. They also found something real crazy, and that is just before a child goes into puberty, their melatonin levels take a drop. And as soon as their melatonin levels take a huge drop, their puberty starts up, uh, puberty cycle starts up. So that's a weird thing. I guess you know you might want to keep your kids asleep. <laughs> so they don't, <laughs> so they don't go into puberty early or something like that. I don't know, I, but they release that information. Uh, the thalamus is just one big relay center. Uh, the thalamus is all about relaying sensory information to where it needs to go. Notice the thalamus is smack dab in the middle of the brain. Um, it's an information filter, and I like the example that our textbook uses. It says that it filters out sounds in a busy cafeteria while you study. Um, that's why sometimes if you're out somewhere you get sensory overload. Sometimes people, they're so excited to take their toddler to Disney World and their toddler is mad while they're at Disney World and he's crying and he's screaming and the parents are mad because they can't understand why their three-year-old is not in love with Disney World. He is literally experiencing sensory overload. The thalamus is supposed to be able to filter all of that out, but you got so many songs. Hey, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. You can only take but so much It's a Small World After All. All right. So you've got like five different Disney princesses. You've got seven different Disney characters all doing their thing. You've got music blaring over the sounds of the loudspeakers, and you decided to take your toddler there in the middle of July when only half the planet is at Disney World. And he's hearing all those sounds, and his thalamus is literally trying to filter out those sounds so that his brain can actually focus on one sound at a time, and his brain can't do that. Therefore, he becomes frustrated, confused, he loses his understanding, and he has what we nicely call a meltdown. They're mad because they spent all that money. They should have consulted 
the grandparents. Anyway, so you don't want to do that. And the same thing happens to people during shopping. Some of you, uh, you love, you live for Black Friday, and some of you hate Black Friday because of just how bad it can be. I noticed that some of the people who love Black Friday live in smaller areas, but if you go to metropolitan areas with large cities and you go out for Black Friday, you might have a different look and take on Black Friday, especially if you get knocked over by some little old lady with a cart. I'm just saying, you know, not saying that that actually happened to me. All right, we're moving right along. So the thalamus is the relay station, and that's the guy that makes sure that incoming sensory information goes to the right areas of your brain, specifically things like association areas, so that you can actually interpret what sensory information just came in. The hypothalamus, we're not going to spend a lot of time on him because there are literally eight different major functions of the hypothalamus. If you if you study the hypothalamus and you tell some you tell your teacher you really don't know anything that the hypothalamus does, that you really didn't read anything about the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has a nickname. It's called the master gland. And the reason why it's called the master gland is because it has literally eight different functions that you can't live without. I mean the hypothalamus is the reason why you go into puberty. If the hypothalamus does not release GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, then puberty does not start. And once it starts releasing GnRH, that's a wrap. You're gonna you're gonna start cycling. And and no offense, fellas, uh, we cycle too. So our cycle is just a little different than women. Women cycle, you know, on that average 28 to 35 day cycle. Men, our cycle is more like a 12-hour cycle, believe it or not. When we get to the reproductive system, we'll kind of talk about that. Uh, so you got the hypothalamus. Um, there you can see some different brain disorders of the diencephalon, which the diencephalon is the thalamus plus the hypothalamus plus the pineal gland equaling the diencephalon. You can see headaches. Um, migraine headaches start here at the diencephalon. Uh, a lot of times it can be linked to just high blood pressure. That can lead to migraine headaches. Not very fun. Uh, lack of sleep can lead to migraine headaches. Uh, extreme stress can lead to migraine headaches. Blood sugar levels can lead to migraine headaches. Cerebral palsy, um, that's actually a group of neuromuscular disorders. It can result from damage to like uh, infant brain um, or impairment uh, of skeletal muscle. And sometimes it even leads to mental retardation. And then encephalitis which encephalitis is an interesting disease because it's acute, so it's not chronic, it's acute, it's not reoccurring. Um, you can actually get encephalitis, and I hate to say it, but you know, this might make a few parents mad, but your kids can get encephalitis by swapping spit. Uh, so, you know, your teenager starts kissing people, drinking behind people. If they've got that virus, they can they can get it just, just by kissing someone and, and, and drinking behind somebody. And the now encephalitis, the virus itself is not funny, but people who have met family members who's come down with encephalitis, they have funny stories to tell because when that person's in the hospital with encephalitis, that person kind of some can experience some cuckoo for Cocoa Puff moments. They kind of go in and out of it. Um, it's just like watching a, a I Love Lucy episode or something with them. Extreme cases of encephalitis can lead to like a coma or death, but those are extremely rare. And usually when someone has encephalitis, it looks like that person has a bad migraine plus a really nasty flu. Um, but then that person starts experiencing some other things along with it, like memory loss. They don't recognize people. They get really irritable. It's kind of almost funny to see this 30-year-old act throwing a tantrum like a four-year-old and they don't recognize anybody in the room but they swear up and down that you're Darth Vader and you're about to take them away and that you're not their father and they start saying that right there in the hospital bed when they come to after a day or two and you start reminding them of that the next thing they want to do is they want to try to pay you off so you don't tell anybody uh, so you got the diencephalon We've got things like the brain stem. The brain stem is made up of three different structures, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And I know I said that I was going to stop at the cerebrum, but I said, hey, let's go ahead and wrap, and wrap this up. But um, the midbrain, one of the key things that you're probably going to notice about the midbrain is you're going to notice that the midbrain literally is a connector that literally connects the diencephalon to the rest of the brain stem. 
Another thing that you'll notice is that the midbrain contains a very special component called the substantia nigra. And the substantia nigra is the place that produces dopamine. Now, that's something that's key to remember because dopamine is a major neurotransmitter in your brain. And dopamine is directly linked to Parkinson's disease. So the lack of dopamine in your brain can, leads to, can lead to Parkinson's disease. That's why they actually produce different um, drugs to help produce the... Uh, well, there's actually two different types of drugs that I've, I've recently read about. One was stimulating the neurons to produce more of the precursor units that you use to produce the neurotransmitter dopamine. And the other one was just replacing the lack of dopamine so that your brain could function in, in this normal way. Um, it's involved in like movement. That's why if you look at Muhammad Ali, you'll notice that he has the tremors and he doesn't move with fluid movements, but instead he's got those shakes. That's because you use dopamine in making fluid movements. It deals with emotions. Um, that's why some people who meet uh, elderly individuals who are dealing with Parkinson's disease, they, they have strong ranges of motions. One day their grandfather is the loving, caring grandfather that they knew, and other moments he's cursing everyone out and kicking everyone out of the house. Uh, and it also deals with pleasure and pain responses. And so uh, this gets into uh, a person's sexuality when they have Parkinson's. All of a sudden they're suddenly very removed from people. They don't enjoy things. They don't enjoy food. They don't enjoy company of, of, of their friends. They, they have a hard time. Um, enjoying anything, and they're not really moved very much at all. Okay, I'm going to keep my promise. I'm going to stop here. Uh, we'll get back into a few more things in the next video. As a matter of fact, we really need to touch on the spinal cord later on, and I know that there's some things that we need to talk about with the spinal cord because I need to talk about two key things with the spinal cord, the information elevator and reflexes. So I'm going to go ahead and bow out gracefully and change this screen share here and I guess I'll see you guys on the next go around. This is the professor talking to you. Peace.